The following program is rated BBMALSA. It contains strong language, sexual situations, awesomeness, and nudity. It is intended only for mature audiences. Listener indiscretions are advised. Welcome to our Bliss Bringers podcast. The materials we cover encourage adults of all ages, nationalities, and sexualities to open up and embrace their wildest desires and blissful pleasures. You won't find medical advice here, just our personal experiences following the journey of sexual evolution and education in sizzling fun topics that were definitely not taught to us in school, but have wickedly blossomed into reality. We discuss adventures in ethical non-monogamy, kinks and fetishes, exotic places to visit, sexy events, workshops, and tips allow us to seduce you into embarking on new adventures where each day you ask yourself what's your pleasure hello hello we are live in another vetcast we're in viva las vegas and we're at we're at this special house it's got all this great uh, rooms in it and everything and we're gonna do a little podcast this morning what did we do last night you guys well, we got to explain. What are we doing in Vegas? Well, we're in Vegas again. This is the time of the year to go to Fetish and Fantasy. What's Fetish and Fantasy? Halloween. It's the best Halloween party ever to happen in uh, Vegas. I mean, naturally, there are freaks here, but when it comes to Halloween, thousands, we're talking thousands, four, five, six thousand people from around the United States and around the world do come to Fetish and Fantasy at Hard Rock. I think last year there was about 7,200 that were Fetish and Fantasy. It was huge. I think it's supposed to be bigger this year. This is our eighth year in Las Vegas, seventh year at Fetish and Fantasy. And oh, by the way, uh, this is Mistress Cindy, and here with me this morning is... Mr. Bill. Reverend John. And the three of us are laying cozy in bed. I'm in between two gorgeous, gorgeous men. <laughs> Hi, diddle diddle. Cindy's in the middle. <laughs> we can talk later. All right. <laughs> I'll talk. You keep your mouth full. <laughs> Wow. There's no way that could go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not going to go wrong. Why would it go wrong? What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> so, and Miss Cindy, what's the subject of the week? I thought we should do like a poly update since our last episode when we announced Mr. Cindy uh, has converted into a poly relationship with Night Owl. I figured the three of us can quickly... Talk about our poly relationships because we know Mr. Bill is Master Poly Bill. <laughs> oh, Lord. My reputation has preceded me. In case you're wondering why I have such a scratchy voice this morning, last night we went to the Mandalay Bay and listened to the band Phoenix play. They're just as dynamite. Uh, 80s uh, cover band, and they're just dynamite. And of course, we sang and danced ourselves crazy till about two o'clock this morning. So that's why we're a little bit slow this morning. But anyway, so back to the Polly thing. Um, yep, Polly's doing really good. I probably have I probably have three Polly relationships that are going on right now. You slow. Uh, one of them is really, really, really special to me. And uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here this weekend because she has family matters that she has to take care of. So, Mr. Bill, what's the difference between being poly and just being slutty? You mean s- slutty? Honey, yes. that's you. You're slutty. Well, I'm not the one with three girlfriends. He's developing relationships. The difference between being a swinger, I think, is what you're trying to say, because you do fit in that category, baby. And a poly is the relationships that you develop. I would say that's right. With uh, the relationships that I have, there's uh, two of them that are really deeply, that I love both of them very, very much. And one of them hasn't quite gotten there yet, but but she's a special person, and I really enjoy being around her. And then there's another, we'll call her Jay, that uh, is involved in this, and she's, you know, I think she's really special too. I've got this relationship with these people, and it's more than just going out on a date and going to dinner and a a movie and just talking. It's a lot more deeply involved. In your status, single, married? Single. And your poly girlfriends? Well, one of them is sort of working on being single. She basically is, but she it, it, it's not official yet. So she's breaking up. Correct. She's breaking up. And then the others? Two of them are married, and one of them is single. And then the ones that are married, their husbands or their partners are good to go with the poly relationship that you're having? Oh, yes. One of them, we'll just call them J and T, um, are in a poly relationship and they've been poly for a long time or at least T has and um the other one 
They have been in a poly relationship for quite a while. In fact, um, she's coming down from uh, up north to visit in January for a week. And That's Miss Alaska we're talking about. Yes, we're talking about Miss Alaska. And Mr. Alaska went to uh, Burning Man this year with uh, his uh, poly girlfriend from uh, L.A. And uh, he's coming down in November. And I think they're going to spend most of the month in November together out in the Mojave Desert. I think we're going to need a whiteboard. <laughs> you, you can't tell the players without a scorecard. So what about you, Reverend John? I'm just doing my old things. And what is that yet, yeah, slut? How's your activities going? I've been focusing more on BDSM play and doing the sub-training, and that's been interesting. So do you have sex with your partners? Sometimes tends to happen, yes. I have yet to see it not happen. <laughs> I've discovered that Reverend John uses his BDSM world acts uh, as his icebreakers. That's how he gets to know people. Let's just say I use all my tools at my disposition. Literally. <laughs> and Mr. Billy, you're the one that created this walking monster over us. I did. I remember about uh, seven years ago in Naughty at New Orleans when I met this couple on a bus from the airport. To the that was the SF Cuties back then. We were going to Naughty at New Orleans, and I was teaching a class on BDSM. And they came to the class, and their eyes were very wide. And then they were very wide open. And look what I have created from that. It's a monster. But I love them. <laughs> we love it, too. So, what are you Reverend, calling a monster? Reverend John, baby. Yes. So in your BDSM world, do you have any special playmates that you regularly play with? And do you, have, do you feel like you've developed a relationship with them? I've been working a lot on Mrs. Puppy. Yes, you know, we all know puppies need a lot of training <laughs> before their house broken. <laughs> Sometimes you have to hit them with a newspaper or something like that. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Puppy, you have my permission. Smack him. Smack John. Would you say that you're developing a relationship? Is that a relationship? Everything is a relationship. That, so that's why I always been asking questions about the poly thing. I remember being in discussions and debates with uh, Miss Shira B. Katz. Once upon a long ago on what is poly and what is swinger and what is the difference. To me, it is just a gradient. You have an emotional involvement with people on a scale. It can be anywhere from you're just a random body part in an orgy pile to, oh, let's move in together and have babies, right? You can go We're from not zero, talking about from, babies. Well, Are no, you but you can go from much. zero I'm to 100. I'm not talking about babies. And everybody just puts their particular relationship somewhere on there. I don't think he answered the question whether or not he considered it. I don't poly. consider myself poly. Let me put it like that. Okay. All right. Moving on. Have you been having fun with your swinger BDSM world? No, it's horrible. Horrible. Somebody has to do it, though. Somebody has to spank those asses. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Mr. Me. Bill, are you doing okay there? I'm, I'm just about to choke over here, but that's okay. Over in the last eight years and being in the lifestyle, we've drastically changed our rules and we're, tr we're changing them now to accommodate further growth. I would consider myself more on the poly scale, especially, you know, especially with Night Owl. So where am I with Night Owl? Night Owl and I have a committed relationship. And in the poly world, I discovered by listening to Loving Beyond Boundaries, which is an awesome podcast, by the way, the word poly fidelitous or poly exclusive. So in our household with John and I, we have a V relationship going on. Basically, I'm doing both men. <laughs> <laughs> and You're just uh, being the princess. <laughs> I know. I'm such a naughty girl. I'm a naughty girl. Hey, you should see the fantasy going on in my head. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. If we had a big enough bed, I'd have all three of us sleeping there. <laughs> well, that's why king size beds were made for. Yeah, but the one thing about Night Owl and I, we do enjoy space. Thankfully, John takes maybe two feet up and doesn't move all night long. So, you know, maybe one of these days we'll. We'll get the three of us in the bed, but we're taking very slow. Night Al and I are enjoying our ride together. And there's a lot of NRE involved here? Yeah. I am like overdosing on NRE. I'm enjoying it. It's like having two 16-year-olds in the household, and I'm the responsible adult. Can uh, you believe that? Yeah. NRE stands for New Relationship Energy. It's that all that giddiness that you have when you just first meet somebody and everything is going great. It's awesome. I love it. I love the feeling, that excitement of seeing him walking in my driveway or if we're meeting for lunch and coffee. I mean, it goes beyond sex. We have a great time just hanging out. And 
I would consider that a relationship. We consider it a relationship. But John, how's that doing for you? I'm okay. I'm glad to see that you're having fun and that you're being positive and uh yeah. What kind of bumps in the roads have we come along? Let's not make it all about good stuff. Bumps in the roads, communication mostly, and setting boundaries and things like that. And so what was our couple of our bumps? Oh, we've had very painful bumps. Ooh, I could bet. Yeah, we've had bumps. Like, everybody needs to be aware that if you get into a relationship, I don't care if you take your relationship and go into a swinger, more casual sex area, or if if you go into a poly relationship, if your relationship, your marriage, or your primary relationship with your partner has any, even the minor fractures in the relationship, there is going to be a bright light being shined on it as soon as you step into multiple relationships. But I think the number one thing that you have to do is you have to be open and honest and communicative about it. You can't hide things. You have to be right out there and tell people everything. And sometimes it might not feel the best to tell them, but it's always better in the very end. And communicate. And I've actually talked to other people about this. You have to be open in telling what, what works for you and what doesn't work. And if there's something that you don't like happening, then you don't have to justify or or prove that it's bad, just saying, okay, I'm not comfortable with this, should be enough for a reason not to do something. I think it should further the discussion, though. It deepens the relationship between you and I in these matters, but, you know, you're an introvert. You're, it's a little difficult to get you to open up and have mm-hmm. full discussions. And now for a word from our sponsors. Do-do-do-do-do. Yay! <laughs> Hi, this is Emily from Cassidy, and you can find me and hundreds of other sexually social swingers at Cassidy.Blissbringers.com. And that's spelled K-A-S-I-D-I-E. Oh no, we lost Cindy and Mr. Bill, but I did discover a wild sub in the house. So let's go talk to her. Well, hello there. What's your name? My name's Renee. And what are you doing with this crazy band of misfits? I am attending my first fetish and fantasy. Ooh. I drove all the way out from County, and I'm really excited. I have no idea what to expect, except a lot of people and a lot of craziness. And a lot of cute booties. How did you get in with this crazy gang? Um, so I found out about FetLife when I was at a sex shop with my best friend. All right. <laughs> There's a story by itself. <laughs> um, and so from... How, a good, how good a friend was this? She's my best friend. Okay. Um, she'd never been to a sex shop before, and she's not from the United States. And she was here visiting me for three weeks, and I wasn't able to convince her to go to one in Japan. So instead, I made her go to one in the U.S. with me. After chasing her around with a dildo... <laughs> And was she really embarrassed? She was so embarrassed. Wait, 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 wait. She's from Japan? Yes. And don't, don't the Japanese also- have all this sort of weird, freaky, tentacle, <laughs> fucked up stuff? Well, she, she was raised in Australia and moved to Japan when she was 18. Okay, I guess that's an excuse. So. Continue. <laughs> um, so after messing with her and all the toys, I was looking at the BDSM section. And I thought everything looked really shiny and exciting. And... One of the attendants came over and said, is there anything you want to take a look at? And I said, no, no, I'm just looking. And she said, well, if you're interested in any of this, there's this website you can check out called FetLife. And so I went home that night with my best friend and I made an account. And she just sat there looking terrified at everything. And I was going, (laughs) oh my gosh, where have you been (laughs) my whole life? So what attracted you there on FetLife and didn't send you screaming like like it does to some other people? You know, the first group that I found was about vampires. Okay. And donating blood to each other so they could drink their own blood. And okay. I figured... <laughs> Sounds like a health risk to me. But anyhow. <laughs> that was the very first thing I found. Everything's got to be downhill from that. <laughs> and it didn't scare me away. It only made me more intrigued. Okay. Because I've been single my entire life. And before entering the scene, I'd only had two or three one-night stands. And I thought, well, everything that my friends are in looks really, really boring. And... I don't want to be boring. So I was back home for the summer and then I entered my senior my senior year of college and I found that there was a munch about 10 or 15 minutes from my school. 
And so I went to that on October 2nd. It's been almost a year now. And I ended up meeting the most amazing group of people. I still talk with everybody that I met that day now, and it's been a year. And it just, as Mr. Bill just said, it went downhill from there. (laughs) So within a week, I was at my first rope event. The next week, I was trying on latex at a friend's house. And the week after that, I went to my first Dragon's Gate party. And it was at DG that I met everybody um, who's the crazy bunch of people with us now. And it was just amazing. These were There were these people who were just enjoying themselves and not giving any craps. And So in summary, you went from zero to fully corrupted within a year? Oh, yes. Awesome. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> and I, I love it. You know, my friends know what I do. Because I'm a fairly open person. They know that I'm poly. They know that I see various people. My roommate, when I came home after being suspended for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, you need to try this. I was six feet off the ground and I was spinning. And she looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I love it. It's taught me to just not give a crap about anything and to just take each day as it be, is. Be non-judgmental. Yeah, non-judgmental. Be more confrontational because with negotiation, when I first started, I was really timid and I couldn't make decisions. And one of my play partners has worked with me and forcing me to make decisions on my own more. And with work, I need I, the job that I have, I do have to be confrontational sometimes, which is not who I am. I was denied a job once because I was too nice. Mm. And so it's been overall just the most amazing thing that I could have done for myself is a Going to that first Dragon's Gate party. Awesome. Since then, what is all on your list of kinks and fetishes? Um, <laughs> no detail is too dirty. Oh, man. Well, I really like cock worship. Okay. I like electricity, shock knives on the back of my hamstrings. I like actual knives. I don't like being cut. Um, I like rope. I love rope. Um, single tails floggers it's a free massage that's what i tell people <laughs> floggers is a free massage i'm experimenting with caning uh-huh. uh, until i cry for a cathartic release one of my play partners and i are working on that um because i am a masochist but i'm not a heavy masochist and so we're slowly building me up more and more i like handcuffs like police issue handcuffs are sexy hmm, interesting a hog tie with a ball gag is okay. one of my favorite positions to be in I like breath play. I like spit. <laughs> um, oh, and I'm a heavy exhibitionist. Oh, okay. We can work with that. I'm amazed and proud that you discovered all that stuff about yourself in sh- such a relatively short term and at a young age, actually. There's people who are in their 50s or 60s who, have, who only then discover what they're into. Yeah. For me, I... One of my earliest quote-unquote sexual memories was when I was in middle school and I was had ex- found porn, the world of Ooh. sex, and I was watching this video of a woman who had rope around her chest and I was like, that just looks weird. So then I go upstairs, I pull out all the belts I can find because <laughs> I was home alone and I start strapping them onto myself around different parts of my body and I was like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. And then I never visited it again. And but then, a kink was born. <laughs> a kink was born that day. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've always been very sexual. Just what? What would you say to others who are thinking about exploring kink or curious about it? I would say, <laughs> shut up, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, do it safely. Do it in a way that you don't feel pressured. Mm-hmm. Go at your own pace. When I entered the scene, a lot of people thought I was going in too fast, too hard. But I knew myself enough to know that I, it was something I, I was able to handle. But I tell other people my age. I had a friend in school. We ended up going to an event together, two events together. And she asked me, if you went to, and did all this in your first few months, why can't I go and do it? And I told her, do you think you can handle it? And she realized that she wouldn't be able to. I told her to not go as fast as I did, to go at her own pace, do it where she felt the most comfortable, whether that would be privately, publicly, um, with finding regular partners, a long-term partner, short-term partner. Find an experiment to what you think goes best with your lifestyle. 
Because for me, I knew I wanted to go in and I wanted to go hard and I was able to handle that. I also don't think you're crazy. You're not crazy. Me personally or in general? <laughs> in general, in general. My friends think I'm crazy as shit. And I tell them I'm not crazy. I just know what I want. <laughs> I have to say it is impressive with your relatively short amount of experience to have that awareness. You have more awareness and are further along into the maturity curve than other people that I know that have been in kink for years. Good job. Thank you. So are you excited about tomorrow? Beyond excited. What do you want to do tomorrow? There are a few things I want to accomplish. Okay. I want to have fun. All right. I love meeting new people and I love talking with people and introducing them to things. And if I'm not If I keep my mouth in check, I can be assertive enough while also very reassuring. I'm hoping that I'm able to greet the people who are going to be coming on stage because I think I look non-threatening. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's true or not. <laughs> um, and I just, I want to meet everybody and hear their experience and hopefully introduce a few more people to the freedom of kink. Are you going to be on stage? I hope so. Okay. I'm sad I can't be naked on stage. I was been told that there's no nipples. Yeah, well, we have. You can have some tape. Oh, I have I have a skimpy outfit that I'm wearing. There you go. It'll do. It'll yeah, do. with a big leather jacket to go over it for the drive over. <laughs> There's more than enough that we need. Yeah, I do hope to get on stage because I know that one of my play partners is going to be up there. If he wants to do a demonstration or somebody is not sure about it, then they can... I've made myself available so that they can have me on stage to help people kind of ease into it if that is necessary. Like knives. So you're ready to be demo bunny? Oh, yes. I love being the demonstration bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, right? Yes. And I'm a dirty girl. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We'll keep that in mind. Hello, this is Bob from Couples Cruise, the leader in adults only, clothing optional cruises. You are listening to Bliss Bringers. For more information on our cruises, go to blissbringers.com slash cruise. See you there. So we are back in our big weird folly discussion where last time we spoke, we were in Vegas having the discussion with Mr. Bill. We were. And then we had to go and spank asses. We are back in the Bay Area. Night Owl. Hello. And we wanted to do a round table and see where everybody is on this adventure we're doing a status update so night owl and i have been dating for two months a little over two months now reverend john and i are married night owl and i are dating how are you boys doing i think you're happier i think you may have more energy that's the observation but what about yourself trying to turn the communication up to 11 so so what are the challenges that you've you've come across with that your wife dating seriously um, the challenges or the weird feelings that i sometimes have what i'd call the woody and buzz lightyear effect you? i think i'm the woody i'm, I'm the old toy <laughs> <laughs> and now Aww. she's all excited as she got a new toy oh is i'm buzz yes <laughs> okay to infinity and beyond man <laughs> there's a snake in my boot i can't honestly imagine what it's like for you Because whether it's my actual psyche or that my culture that I had growing up has affected me this way, I don't honestly know which one it is. But I can't imagine what it's like for you to be in the middle where you have this intimate emotional time with John and then switch to me or vice versa. And you've mentioned that it's difficult to switch gears for myself because I am one of these people who becomes emotionally monogamous. It is not a choice that I make. I haven't said I am going to be monogamous with you because culturally I say I have to. None of that exists for me. But what does happen is emotionally I shut everybody else out. I don't try to. I don't mean to. It simply happens. I shut everybody else out. So I can't imagine myself being in a position where I have an emotional bond with you, where we ground with each other, where we spend very intimate time with each other, and then switch gears and do that with somebody else. I would feel very, very strange doing that. And I know it would take me a great deal of time to do it. This is why I couldn't cheat, <laughs> because I wouldn't have the ability to 
go home or go out and be able to mentally switch gears that quickly. I couldn't do it. Okay. Um, and I would argue that that's a challenge for a lot of people and probably a big challenge in this community to be able to switch over quickly enough that you don't suddenly start doing something that your partner finds or begins to interpret that you're being distant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you could be emotionally tied in with John and have this time where you're spending time grounding and being very tight with him. You come to me and kudos to you for being able to switch gears so quickly. I know it's difficult, but if you couldn't, then there would be that time where I would see you being very distant. And then the natural question is, so what's going on in our relationship? What's wrong with me? Or what is it that she believes is wrong with me that's causing her to be this distant, even though there's no such thing? Right. And I think that happens fairly often. You have a relative, either your grandfather or your uncle. How many girlfriends? Uh, three or four. I'm not actually sure. I don't think he'll tell you he's in love with any of them. Okay. He may have an affection for them. He definitely gets a lot of exercise with them <laughs> and enjoys his playtime with them. But I would argue that they're more swinger-ish. They're sexual relationships far more than they are emotional ones, at least for him. But there is an emotional involvement. There is always an emotion. Them. Yeah, there's but always that, an emotional the, involvement. This is point, true. That's the point that I'm, I'm getting to. It's a gradient. Oh, sure. I have some emotional involvement in my play partners. Not as deep, but I think I can, I can switch. I can talk to somebody and talk to, to somebody else. If everybody involved knows exactly what's going on. And I think that is maybe what the differentiator is, is that if people, if you do that with quote unquote vanilla people, then they're going to be freaking out. That's my point. They don't have the freedom and the openness to. Yes share and explain what's going on. I think, you know, keeping some of these secrets inside makes the vanilla people explode. You know, if they're cheating or if they're seeing someone or they, they develop feelings for someone else, this is where it frazzles their brain. Yes. You have some emotional involvement with everybody that you play with on some level. I'm talking about taking that next step that the call it the romantic step, the step where you start thinking about that person far more than sexually, far more than in a way that is friendly. Um, romantic is honestly the only word that I can use. And having multiple romantic partners is having a romantic partner is a very tiring. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> yeah, it can be, this is true. <laughs> But it is a very special form of thought. It is a very special form of, of energy exchange between you and that person. And to have to do that with multiple people, even just two, is, is difficult. I mean, I honestly cannot see myself. I could maybe see myself doing it, but then being able to switch between those two partners has got to be exhausting. It's very hard. It's very difficult. It's one of my challenges right now, enjoying moments with you and then switching to see John. It's been a major mental fuck because there's times that I start to think, oh, I shouldn't be showing this intimacy level with John. I, I'm i with you. And my brain is like, but you're married to him and you love him and you want to be with him. And so I get in this this huge mental conflict and to where I start to get just spun up. And, and this is as somebody who already identifies as poly, oh, yeah. already identifies as open. Right. Now imagine what it's like for somebody who has never had this experience. I've never had this experience. Before. Not, not poly. No, but you've at least had the experience of being in an intimate relationship, but have, but being non-exclusive sexually. Yeah. It's completely different on the swinger life. True enough. But at least it's a, step where somebody who's purely vanilla doesn't even have that step. Yeah. If they haven't been a serial cheater, I guess you're right. Right. Well, again, cheating is, is a completely different bag that brings. Not really. It, it, the I, only I would, thing is that you're holding is. secrets inside, but you're still sharing intimate times with somebody else and you're developing a relationship. At least I did the people that I cheated with. They weren't casual bar guys. These are people that I developed relationships with over work or sports or something. But let me ask you this. How did the fact that you had to hide these relationships 
change both the dynamic of that relationship and the relationship that you were hiding from. Okay. Okay. Completely. Right. Right. Completely different from yeah, what because you're going it wasn't, This is why I say that cheating honest. becomes its own. It becomes yeah, its own topic of conversation. You still have to switch gears. I don't care no if question. everything is out out in the open or if you're hiding it, you still have to switch gears. You're seeing boyfriend number one, and now you're going to go out with boyfriend even, number two. It's going to be even harder if you're cheating. Oh, yeah. It's got to be. Because then you can't give any hint of the others. Yeah. There's lots of lies. That's the part that kills. So in this case, I have everything out in the open. There is no lies. The communications is the biggest thing, but the challenge is switching the gears and making sure not to make one of you feel inferior or less loved. It's just like children. I, it's just <laughs> like children. We're kids. You apparently. are kids, but it Mom. is. <laughs> no, we are not going age play. <laughs> no age play. No, it really is like this, though. It, with children where they, they're they competitive, one feels that the other one is getting love more than they are. It's just, it is a challenge. I think I can do it. I'm not doing a great job. I'm identify. I give you more intimacy that I give John. And I think that's the Buzz Lightyear Woody thing going on, but it's, it's balancing out. And I think it also has to do with John and I have some cracks in, in our foundation that we're in the midst of healing. So they always say, you know, never introduce Swinger lifestyle or poly lifestyle to a relationship that is not 100% solid. Sorry, I don't think there is too many perfect relationships out there. Uh, but it does shine the bright light on it and we're fixing what we, mm -hmm. what we have going on. I adore you both. I really do. And I feel in my heart, I've got this sharing, this share of intimacy and love and compassion. And I want you both in my life. I don't want to lose either one of you. Part of your struggle is saying that I should be treating John and Night Owl the same way. I should be intimate with both of them the same way. And I think you're beginning to understand now that your relationship with John is different from your relationship with me. And so it's never going to be the same between the two of you as it is between you and me and vice versa. You both are different men, so it can't be. Exactly my point. But there was a time there where I think you were struggling with the fact that the relationships were different. How so? You had a certain type and level of intimacy with me that you found was different or even lacking from your level with John, but you have a level of, of closeness and intimacy with him that doesn't exist between you and me. And for a while there, I saw you struggling with that. And you had a, a very definite problem with the fact that you would say to me, well, I'm, I'm feeling a certain way for you that I don't feel for John. But I would see you feel a certain way for John that you weren't feeling for me. True. And you were struggling with that. And I think either consciously or unconsciously, you're now coming to terms at your core with the idea that your relationship with the two of us is going to be different. Even if I wasn't married to John and you both were just my boyfriends, I, yes, that is an accurate statement, but I don't know if we're thinking of it on the same lines. Well, I haven't in the last at least couple, three weeks, I haven't seen you struggle with it the way you did in the beginning. It is still new for all three of us. It's completely different than the swinger lifestyle. There's a true investment of emotion and time in a poly relationship that it's not there in the swinger lifestyle. You and I have been in the swinger lifestyle, ethical non-monogamy for eight years. Seeing the transition of me going into a, a polyamorous relationship, what would be the biggest... I guess that what's the biggest change that you've seen in yourself? I do think that I communicate a little bit better with my partner, play partner of a sort, and that I'm not freaking out for any relationship wise or that other out of swing or scope. If that makes sense. No, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, Nido. Hey. So, how's the poly life? Well, it is, it's different. It's been interesting, you know. It is still a very strange thing to say to your girlfriend, I hope everything's working really well with your husband. That is just a 
I'm still trying to wrap my head around doing that because most of us out there in a more vanilla world, non-poly world, would find that a very odd thing to say. I have a vested interest in your relationship being strong, okay? Uh, it's a lot to me. The better your relationship is, the happier you are, happier I am, better really well. Life. Better all of it. Absolutely, yeah, the sex life, absolutely. Um, there are challenges, of course. Uh, Expand on that. Lord, how long do you want me to go with this? Like, well, as I've read and as I've discovered myself, one of the issues that I deal with is the little green monster of jealousy does come. It is, I think, natural for us to feel a jealousy when somebody that we are in love with happens to interact with somebody else in an intimate and romantic way. Dealing with that, and I'm not going to say that it's a very strong or aggressive form of jealousy, but it is absolutely there, and it's something to acknowledge and something to work with. Any interaction can do it. Um, something as simple as a hug can do it. Is that John? John specifically, and not every time. Please understand, it's not like every time you hug John or every time you kiss John, it becomes a problem. Not at all. 99% of the time, I don't even think about it. There is that 1% of the time that it does come up where, and it's more, it's a little twinge, it's a little pang that comes. You recognize it, or I do, and there, but it does happen, okay? There are the feelings that can come across when the two of you live here. So whether you and I spend an hour with each other or we spend two days with, at the end of whatever time we spend with each other, you're going home to John. And there are the little things that we all do at home, whether it be going over mail together, dinner, whatever the little things things life that happen that are your experience not out okay mm -hmm. that you would never think would be something about it's a a very odd thing it is a very new experience i'm still wrapping my head around that there will be updates folks <laughs> i consider myself emotionally monogamous in the sense that i have no interest in anyone else however i am very clearly in a polyamorous relationship so i'm both the best way to put it so you just heard night out talking about some jealousy and I think that's a, a new emotion you may be experiencing. You've had a couple of twinges of growth over the last couple of weeks. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. It's human to have these things. Like, why does she do that with him but not with me? And do the comparison of behaviors. Like the fact that you are doing way more BDSM stuff with him than with me. Uh, is for some of those things that make you go, hmm, <laughs> that I've never seen you do. I think that what you're experiencing is healthy and normal. For the record, he has a date tomorrow. I know nothing. <laughs> and for the other record, he had three girls last weekend. So he's doing just fine, everyone. But it is different, isn't it, between a swinger relationship and a polyamorous relationship? Absolutely. There's different sort of feelings that, that go on. And, and I do like my friends, and I do, to, you, to use a loaded word, I, I love some of our friends. They're good friends. What questions do you guys have? As the woman in the middle, the and, having, <laughs> and having to balance the husband and the boyfriend, how is the experience for you, and what challenges are you facing? There's not enough time in the day. <laughs> That's the challenge. There's a conflict that goes on in my head and my heart. Uh, between the two of you men, I am learning to balance it out better. In the beginning, it was very strong focus on you, Night Owl. And I gave up quite a bit of my own personal projects uh, just because I didn't have enough time to fulfill for uh, being the wife and being the professional worker and being best friends for my girlfriends and mom and now girlfriend you know, for you. So I gave up some of my personal stuff. It's finally coming back around though. I'm finally uh, figuring out a more healthy balance. I'm not staying up till 2 a.m. in the morning texting you. <laughs> uh, yes, we were 16 year olds. <laughs> I loved it. Our honeymoon stage is fun. Absolutely. I don't want to change. I like it. I, I remember you up and about at half past crack and dawn and uh, jumping and doing your p90x and stuff and <laughs> but when you when you start texting till 2 a.m that doesn't really happen no no i do need my beauty rest <laughs> okay. yeah so i the for me it's been very fulfilling in the sense that uh night owl you bring pieces to my life that were missing for a very long time that i didn't realize you uh opened up uh, parts of my heart, uh, specifically in the intimacy and the romance area, I I forgot about. 
Uh, and then, you know, with John, I have, you know, long, a long history and stability and, um, I, I'm more fulfilled now with two men and I feel that I, I, I found what I was supposed to be looking for this whole entire time. I've been a serial cheater since I was 14 years old. There hasn't been a guy in my history that I haven't cheated on until I met John. And then we went into an ethical non-monogamy relationship. But there was always a piece of me that was missing something. Swinger lifestyle was not for me. Um, having you in my life as my intimate partner and John as my intimate partner, I'm very happy, very happy. Uh, sexually fulfilled is another one. Yes, I'm a size queen, and I absolutely am blessed <laughs> she's a, with she's, two men. She's more <laughs> than well than one type of queen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am proud to say that. Um, she's greedy. I am very greedy, and I don't want to share. You know, with John, it's different sharing because we went into this together, and I have uh, an understanding. His appetite is different than my appetite, and... With you and I, Night Owl, we have more of a an exclusive relationship in dating. And we just made that decision not too long ago. So you'll be leaving me soon for some travels on the other side of the world. But we have an agreement that we'll hold off on extracurricular activity. That's right, we do. <laughs> we'll be doing video sexting. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, John, you're going to have John, the Skype isn't working! <laughs> <laughs> fix it, fix it. <laughs> I'm hi. just about to get off come and fix the Wi-Fi. <laughs> not now oh my fucking batteries are gone again didn't you charge this Nina doesn't need to be charged she no but it has to need battery batteries you know what's so funny is that's going to happen. <laughs> of course it is. I can already see it happen. John, you're going to have to pick up those pieces for me. Uh-huh. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> All right. The audience doesn't get to see you rolling your eyes. No, but they can imagine it. So the three of us are going to be flying to Italy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're taking Night Owl. John, you're coming with me because you're going to have to put me back onto the plane so I don't stay over there. That ought to be interesting. Yeah. It will be. It will be. I met Night Owl's mom. No, yeah. That was yeah, a big did. step. That's a huge step. She was nervous about it for many days. Oh, you yeah. Were? I was. Wow. <laughs> you didn't show it. I told her, everybody loves you. But yeah. <laughs> for the record, they got along fine. I texted her, are you making fart jokes yet? Oh, my God. I couldn't <laughs> believe when you text me that. I did not want to even read it. When I turned the phone over and I saw that, I'm like, really? Don't do that. <laughs> no, I, I was able to sit there with his mother and listen to all the stories of when he was younger. All the most embarrassing stories. Yes, she was going down that, that path. It was pretty funny. Uh, the joys of parents. It was very traditional. And his mother is aware that I'm married. Yes. Yeah, she is. She is. So this relationship hasn't been hidden from her. Uh, not at all. Not from the beginning. She's always known that I've been going out with a married woman and has been accepting from day one. She did say that she was happy to see her son happy. So, you know, from a relationship standpoint, what are you and I working on, John? Communication mostly. Yeah. We're now at that part where we're having the standard uh, poly hurdles, which is jealousy, communication, and I guess scheduling. Scheduling, right. That's the big thing is just making sure that we're clear with scheduling. The communication is key. It's been challenging because to say that as an introvert, you don't necessarily clearly communicate your emotions and feelings to me on an honest level. I think that you try to give me as much room as possible, but you sacrifice some of your happiness. So I'm picking up you know, ways to help communicate better with you as a husband and wife mm -hmm. i think one of the big realizations mm -hmm. is that you have to be able to to open up and spill out the feelings regardless of what the other person thinks about it and then the other person has to be able to to accept those feelings without trying to be defensive or trying to fix that 
And sometimes all you have to do is just listen. That's true. That's true. I've been sitting here watching the two of you just seeing this exchange that I like, by the way. Um, it is true that communication is the biggest key to success that I've seen. Uh, jealousy is obviously going to be the biggest issue. It has been, and it will be going forward. It's a natural human emotion. And the only real cure for it, if you will, is communication. Imagination is a wonderful thing, but it can also be terrible when jealousy kicks in and you start thinking things that you know aren't real, but they still come up in your own head. And it's important to communicate those things to both of you, to say this is what I am feeling, this is the thoughts that race through my head, even though I know they're false, to get them out there. It's possible that we, and we all do this, we will do things that will give an impression that are not actually true. The example is this last weekend while you were in Vegas. 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 Fetish and fantasy. And you were telling me a lot of what was going on, just in general. Very basic idea of what's going on. Frankly, folks, very G-rated conversations. A little sad in that sense. But... <laughs> they were not. I... Okay, occasional PG, really a lot of G conversation. <laughs> Sushi conversation for half an hour is G-rated, folks. Okay. That's true. Yeah. So... Here is this conversation going on about some really basic stuff, but about some folks that she's known for many, many years that I don't know at all. And what goes on in my head is Las Vegas sexually charged situation equals crazy imagination. Right? <laughs> imagination. <laughs> and it's just, and it can be, it can be very, very terrible. And it brings up that nasty little green monster. And I told you on more than one occasion, this is what's, even while you were there, this is what's going on in my head, okay? Made you aware of it, let you know that I know it. I know it's not true. I know that nothing happened, um, but that the feeling is still there, okay? And to your credit, you came back and said, look, I understand. I get that. And, you know, it's not happening. And you were reassuring, also very important. So... You know, take away communication, communication, communication. If you think you're communicating enough, you're not. Um, <laughs> talk more. Get it out there. Over communicate. You, you actually can't. You really can't over communicate. Um, I think there's hardly a day that goes by that we don't talk about something on some level about the relationship. And I mean that literally. Not a day goes by that we don't on some level. And that's important and something we need to keep doing and i highly recommend anybody else who decides to take this dive does as well you know just to make sure you guys know i also have jealousy i do john you and your friends mm -hmm. lady friends and stuff even this last weekend you know i get jealous i'll walk in and you'll have your hand down someone's pants or you'll be making out you're a slut i but have no I, recollection of i love you that way and i wouldn't want to change you but I get jealous. I always have. It's just I want you to be happy. And I know that we live different lifestyles when it comes to relationships. You're more casual and more and more formal and intimate. But I I do experience the little green giant. Would you call it the green monster of jealousy? The green monster. Yeah. And with you, I also do. I do. I have jealousy. I keep thinking when you go to Europe, all those gorgeous Italian ladies. With Mama you. mia. <laughs> <laughs> so the jealousy thing is a real emotion and it takes some maturity just to control it so it doesn't get out of hand. And then just communicating with you guys. And this is where I will come back about that communication piece. So this is not the first time I've heard about your jealousy with my time in Europe and the fact that I'm going to be surrounded theoretically by all these great, beautiful women. They are. I'll take your word for it. Don't challenge and me. I I'll have... go find them when I'm there for two weeks. <laughs> but what have I done every time you've brought that up? And it's the same thing you've done for me. And as I've reassured you that the only person I happen to be interested in right now is you. I don't, half the time, I don't even notice anyone else. But there's that level of commitment inside of me that says, even if I do see somebody who's attractive, number one, you, is overriding all of that. And I made a commitment, I made a promise, and I plan on sticking to it. And there's going to be times you're going to come back and you're going to say, you know, I'm worried about you're over there with all these women and I'm going to need to be reassuring to you at the same time 
that you're going to have to come back to me and say, you know, yes, I went to a party. No, I didn't do anything. Everything's all right. I Take fucked a John instead. Darn. <laughs> well, you know that one. I can't do it. I got a you're snake okay. in my boot. <laughs> <laughs> I did open it up and give you the freedom. And I encourage you while you were over there to explore. And the conflict I mean, that I'm having is, do I want the details or do I want to just not know the details? Because I know you'll be back in July, but I'm sitting here thinking, I, I would want the freedom. Like if I was going away for six months in Europe or Australia or somewhere along those lines where those gorgeous hunks are, I would want the freedom. I wouldn't want someone to put an exclusivity on me. Which, to the point, neither one of us has put an exclusivity no. on the other, okay? But we have both made the promise and commitment individually that we're not going to do anything. So it's not you holding me to some standard. It's my saying to you, right. I don't want to do this. This is my personal feeling. This is my emotion. I don't John's want to rolling his eyes. Yeah, John's just not getting this in any way, shape, or form, folks. He's looking at us very puzzled right now. <laughs> Where are you guys going for references, or how are you getting your guidance on maneuvering a poly relationship? I'm also listening to some podcasts, and I'm talking to some to some poly people. Um, Heaven that... forbid you're speaking to poly people. Yes, <laughs> but I'm not doing potlucks. I gotta draw the line somewhere. So you're leveraging the community. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Do you have any specific? books or podcasts that you're listening to that you would recommend the classic work is called more than two the book and the bible I is wouldn't call that a classic it's only been out for two three years well classic classic by now and i think the the bible is the ethical slut yes there's actually a new version that's being written the 20th anniversary is coming up for it so the ethical slut is almost old enough to break <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. How about you, Night Owl? Listen to a couple of podcasts. I have a therapist that I see who happens to be poly friendly, who makes a great sounding board for me. So somebody I can talk to professional that I can talk to that allows me to open up fully about what's going on, the good, the bad, the ugly, and uh gives me a reality check from time to time. Sometimes it's good and puts a smile on my face. Sometimes not so much, but it's still both help. And it's been very useful. Good. Myself, I've been listening to Loving Beyond Boundaries. It's a podcast. It has lots of great resources, speakers that are authors, uh, therapists, uh, experts in the ethical non-monogamy communities in various areas. So I would I would highly recommend that blog as well as the podcast. All right, we will put those in the show notes. Yes, 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 yes. And the Ethical Slut actually is a great book. That was one of the first ones that I ever read. Yep, it's a classic. I wear the slut name very proudly now. There's no slut shaming. If someone calls me a slut, I will say yes. I try very hard. Next time we do a podcast, the three of us, can we do it naked? Okay. <laughs> okay. I just think it would make it more entertaining. Yeah, so we can do a bet cast. Uh, there wouldn't be any podcasting. <laughs> There'd just be sound effects. Until next time, what's That's your pleasure? pleasure. All names mentioned in this show are either fictional, taken from public record, or held by people who have given their explicit consent to be mentioned. I went for a skinny dip. I know. I can't believe that you went out there and got in that pool. That pool's water in that pool's got to be 60 degrees or something. I kept Jesus. reminding myself, Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. Oh, my God. It's very refreshing. I wouldn't get in that pool. Maybe if it was sunny or something like that. But My nipples could cut diamonds. Oh, my God. I guess they could. My kitty shrank, and all I can think about is shrinkage. Shrinkage. Oh, my God, that would have been terrible. Alexa, tell us a joke. What did the father buffalo say to his son when he left for college? Bye, son. Okay, that is just, <laughs> that's about terrible. the same. No, 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 no. These horrible jokes. Bye, son. Next time, tell her to tell you a good joke. <laughs> Alexa, tell us a Star Trek joke. How many three does it take to change a light bulb? Two.
one to change the bulb and the other to insult the other for being afraid of the dark. That's good. I like that. <laughs> That was funny. <laughs> you guys are laughing at. It was funny. Dumb. <laughs> Go back to the bison. 